Okay, so uh, let us continue where we left off before the meal here. So we are looking at the uh, Bojangas, the seven factors of awakening, and uh, uh, just finished looking at the five hindrances, which I, which I mentioned, as I mentioned, are very closely related uh, to the Bojangas. Uh, and now I want to come back to the uh, Bojangas again, and I want to have a look at the Sutta, which shows how they are causally conditioned, uh, one leading to the other one. I already mentioned this, but it's kind of good to actually have a look at the Sutta, which shows how this, this works. Uh. So this Sutta is called Ethics, uh, on page 116 in your marvelous little booklet. Uh, um, and uh, this is how it, how it goes. Uh. Mendicants. When a mendicant is accomplished in ethics, uh, stillness, samadhi, uh, wisdom, freedom, and the knowledge and vision of freedom, uh, even the sight of them is very helpful. Page 116. 116, yeah. Uh, even the sight of them is very helpful. Uh, this is what I mentioned the other day. So just even seeing someone like this is considered very helpful. Uh, which is kind of nice. It kind of uh, shows you that uh, you can a lot can be happened through sight because you know, the external characteristics is like you are, as I mentioned before, it's like you're reading someone's mind. You can see by the way they act that there must be something extraordinarily going on in someone's mind like that. Uh, even to hear them uh, is uh, even to hear them uh, is very helpful. I say here, uh, even to pay homage to them or to visit them. Uh, uh, is very helpful, I say. Even to approach them is very helpful, uh, I say. Um, even to recollect them, uh, even to think about them, uh, yeah, is very helpful, I say. Uh, even to go forth after them uh, is very helpful, I say. Uh, so recollection is that this is one of the reasons why we do this Anusati recollection of the Buddha and the Sangha, uh, because these are the people who have these qualities, uh, yeah, that's what we kind of had a look at, look at before. Uh, and then to go forth after them, I wonder whether go forth after, probably I wonder whether it's more like going forth under them might be better, in the sense that you become their disciples. Uh, that might be even, even more kind of correct there. Uh, going forth after doesn't really have the sense of discipleship, it could be a long time, uh, but uh, this is like more go, uh, be, yeah, being their students. Why is that? Uh, because after hearing the teaching of such mendicants, uh, a mendicant will live withdrawn in both body and mind uh, as they recollect and think about that teaching here. So this is how the starting point of the Bojangas is here uh, said to be the recalling of a particular teaching. Uh, and this is what I was mentioning before, that the idea of uh, giving rise to mindfulness can come from many different sources. Uh, it can be the Satipatthana, uh, breath meditation, or it can be things like just hearing a teaching uh, and then contemplating that teaching. Uh. And uh, interesting here, if you hear a profound teaching by someone, uh, you just want to withdraw. Uh, you want to go into solitude uh, and you want to uh, uh, then uh, recollect that teaching as a consequence. Uh. So uh, this is the beginning. This is the beginning of mindfulness. This is the, what mindfulness means in this particular case. Uh, uh, the understanding, the teaching, and the wanting to withdraw into solitude. Remember what it said in the beginning, that the uh, uh, seven bhujangas are supported by, aided by, viveka, by seclusion. Uh, so this is kind of, it comes out here as well, the idea that you, l you want to live withdrawn by body and mind. This is the uh, viveka here, a uh, kaya viveka and, and, and uh, chitta viveka. Uh. At such a time, a mendicant has activated the awakening factor of mindfulness. Then once you have activated it, you develop it and you perfect it. As they live mindfully in this way, they investigate, explore, and inquire into that teaching with wisdom. So you investigate whatever teaching you get, and this is kind of what we are sort of doing now, but you, you do it on your own. Uh, one of the, I think, important things about the Dhamma is that uh, uh, it is far more powerful if you investigate it for yourself uh, and then you kind of feel you have an un your own understanding of these teachings. Uh, uh, one thing is to be, you know, to listen to someone, that some, sometimes that is nice and it gives you a good starting point. Uh, 
But when you actually think about them for yourself and you get gain some of the same insights and some of this inspiration when you read it, actually often it is much more powerful because it becomes your wisdom rather than just being something you hear. Yeah. This is what I always found in my own life. One, you know, sometimes it can be very nice to listen to someone like Ajahn Brahm, but other times uh, just investigating these things on your own can also be very, very powerful and useful. Yeah. So you investigate these things and because you are dealing with the Dhamma, you, are kind of you, you understand what these teachings are aiming at. This is what we were talking about, the Atta Veda and Dhamma Veda. You understand the purpose of these teachings. Uh, you understand that they are, very, they are meaningful in the deepest possible sense. Uh, and of course, that then gives rise to this energy. Yeah. So, uh, uh, as they live mindful in this way, they investigate, explore and inquire into their teaching with wisdom. Uh, at such a time, a mendicant is activating uh, has activated the awakening factor of investigation of principles or investigation of teaching might be a better translation in this case because it's concerned a particular teaching here. They then develop that investigation uh, of principles or teachings and they perfect it to keep on investigating until you understand it fully. And as they investigate the principle with wisdom in this way, uh, the energy is aroused uh, and it unflagging. In other words, the energy remains strong throughout. Uh, um, I'm just going to have a look at the uh, some of the Pali words here because uh, mm, investigate it with wisdom, panyaya. Yeah. So you have to investigate with wisdom. Yeah. This is kind of the problem. If you don't investigate with wisdom, then uh, it's not going to have the same power, of course. Uh, so it has to be a wise kind of investigation when you do these things. Uh, this, uh, of course, is the difficult part, uh, is no, uh, knowing how to investigate this w uh, with wisdom. Uh. So then you investigate with wisdom, the energy gets aroused, because uh, as you do that, when you focus on the Dhamma, you understand where the meaning of life is, you abandon all the other stuff which is not meaningful, and especially you abandon the sensory world, uh, and when you abandon that, so many of the defilements go with it. Uh, yeah, because you know it is, it is like, uh, it is useless, it is pointless, uh, it is a waste of time, it doesn't give any real satisfaction. Uh, and it's kind of weird how we are immersed in this world, which really, in the end, never gives any real satisfaction. So you go beyond that, that let go of it, uh, and then the energy comes, uh, because your mind is purified. Uh. And then, uh, that is kind of the hard part, and then the rest of the sequence is exactly what we saw before. Uh, I'll read through it, just to show you how it works. Uh, so it, uh, this causality, going from one to the other one here, uh, one to the next one. Uh. At such a time, a mendicant has active activated the awakening factor of energy. Then you develop that and you perfect it. Uh, when they are energetic, the spiritual rapture arises. Uh, this is the piti, yeah? your energy comes uh, and now you are kind of already into the meditation. Now you're probably watching the breath at this point because you're getting into the meditation practice uh, and it goes deeper and deeper. So the spiritual rapture arisi arising, often coming with uh, the uh, together with the um, uh, with the energy and the mindfulness, all of these things coming together here. Um. Ah, yeah, spiritual rapture is niramisa piti here, the piti which is uh, related to uh, the samadhi and the jhanas and that kind of thing here that arises. Here. At such a time, a mendicant has activated the awakening factor of. Uh, joy or rapture, uh, and they develop that, they perfect it. Uh, when the mind is full of rapture, the, m the body becomes tranquil, mind and body become tranquil. Uh, yeah, again, to be expected, uh, because uh, this is the, the sequence, kayo pasambati, chittang pi pasam pasambati. Uh, so the mind becomes calm and tranquil as you take the, uh, as you develop the PT. Yeah, this, is, this is kind of the point here. Each one of these factors have to be developed and cultivated. Uh, and as you take them forward, then the next factor is like it arises within the previous one. Uh, it is something deeper, uh, comes from, from within the previous one. Uh, it's like when you do the breath meditation, it's like you are abandoning things uh, and you go further into the breath, become more mindful, moving into things. Uh, and things are getting abandoned. Uh, so within where you are already, that's where you find the deeper truth, the deeper reality. Uh. At such a time, a mendicant has activated the awakening factor of tranquility. Uh. 
they develop that and perfect it. Uh, yeah, keep on becoming tranquil, taking it more and more deep. And when the body is tranquil uh, and one feels bliss, this is the sukha which comes from that tranquility, then the mind becomes immersed uh, or stilled, if you like, in samadhi. The samadhi arises because you're feeling so much happiness uh, that the mind is uh, so drawn to it uh, that the stillness happens, uh, the concentration happens, if you like, uh, automatically as, as a consequence. At such a time, a mendicant has activated, uh, oops, something is missing here, of factor of equanimity. Er, something seems to be missing. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, they closely. Oh, okay, that's of course. Yeah, sorry, I'm 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 just gonna skip something there. Yeah. So when the body is tranquil, feel bliss, the body becomes immersed in samadhi. At such a time, a mendicant has activated the awakening factor of samadhi or stillness that develop in a cultivated, uh, perfected. So of course, the perfection of samadhi is the four jhanas, uh, and when you read the fourth jhana, then they closely watch over that mi mind immersed in samadhi. This is the upeka. Uh, some bojanga that you get as a consequence of that, uh, and you have taken the uh, the seven factors of awakening to the pinnacle, to the peak. Uh, there is nothing beyond this. Uh, at such a time, a mendicant has activated the awakening factor of equanimity, and then you even develop and perfect that. Uh, so you make sure that you have uh, easy access to upeka and the fourth jhana as you go along here. So this is how it is. Uh, uh, one thing leads to another, uh, and one thing, it is a sequ sequential sequence. Uh, and as always, it is the first part that is the most difficult to kind of to uh, get started. Uh, and once you get started with the sequence, uh, then all you really have to do is to be, uh, to sit back and allow it to develop. It's interesting here, all the way through it says that you are to develop and perfect all of these factors. Uh, but a lot of that development and perfection happens uh, you learn, of course, you learn how to be still, you learn how to be non-interfering, allowing the process to kind of take its own course. Uh, but a lot of it also happens outside of the samadhi, how you live your life, how, how you do things, that you do proper sense restraint and all these kind of things. Uh, and as all of these other factors come together, this process automatically becomes more powerful. And then when you sit down, it just carries on all the way through until uh, you get into the jhana states and all of that. Uh, so this is how this process, too, like all the other things we have seen, is uh, to a large part, it's automatic. Uh. So developing it and cultivating it, uh, or perfecting it, uh, just means that, the ability to stay with it and allow it to develop by itself. So that's the, uh, uh, the Bojangas, uh, and then when you come to the very end of the Bojangas, uh, you come to the Upeka uh, Bojanga, uh, because it is the end of this, and these are the things that lead to awakening, then bang, you are you awaken as a consequence, uh, because you bring that right view with you from the beginning, and then the whole uh, thing happens because of that. Uh. Okay, it was very similar to what I discussed before, because I already went into this. Uh, I want to have a look at one more sutta on the Bojangas before we start looking at the next thing here. This is called the uh, Kundalya Sutta. Uh, and this again shows some of the various factors of uh, the 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas, how they operate together uh, to some extent. Uh, and this is uh, one that shows it in a very nice way. And it's similar to one of the other suttas that I've read out here before, maybe a couple of years ago or something, uh, but from a slightly different angle again. Uh. This is to Kundalia. At one time the Buddha was staying near Saketa in the deer park in the Anjana wood. And that is the same place we saw just recently. Uh, then the wanderer Kundalia went up to the Buddha and exchanged greetings with him. Uh, when the greetings and polite conversation were over, uh, he sat down uh, yeah, to one side or whatever uh, and said to the Buddha, Master Gotama, I like to hang around the monastery <laughs> and visit the assemblies. Uh, I told you Adan Sudato is down to earth. Yeah, it's kind of this is the ordinary language that people use to each other. Uh, so even these wonders they were just hanging around. Uh. <laughs> when I finish breakfast, when I finish breakfast, uh, it's my habit to wander from monastery to monastery, from park to park. Uh. 
There I see some ascetics uh, and Brahmins speaking for the sake of winning debates and finding fault. Uh, but what benefit does Master Gotama live for? Uh, and um, so here you have this wanderer whose habit is to kind of wander around from monastery to monastery, from park to park. He has kind of uh, some interest in all of these uh, spiritual teachings, presumably, uh, but he hasn't kind of committed, probably not committed yet to one or the other, so he's wandering around. Uh, uh, perhaps he's, he's uh, one of these people who prefer to debate the Dhamma rather than actually practice it. I'm not sure. That is, there's quite a few of those uh, in, in the Buddhist world as well. Uh, there's, uh, people often find it easier to debate than to practice. Uh, but uh, anyway, so he sees, and this is kind of interesting, he sees that uh, many of these people, you speak for the sake of winning and debates and finding fault. Uh, and this is a very common thing, I find that very common in Buddhism as well, uh, whereby uh, peop you, know, it's you, you try to, uh, because your ego sometimes is involved in these things, uh, then it's important for, you feel it's important to kind of win the debate and to be right, and this way is the right one, all other ways are wrong, and this is what you should be doing. Uh, uh, and sometimes that is very tedious and tiresome, and uh, it uh, takes away some of the joy and beauty of these teachings. Uh, and what is interesting about the Dhamma is that um, in many ways there are often many different angles you can take on these teachings. Uh, it is not necessarily the case that there is only one way or one way of doing things that is absolutely right. Uh, uh, very often e many different angles can have different, you know, uh, aspects that, that that work. For example, you know you have the Gwenka technique in meditation, and uh, uh, and although I don't always agree with the Gwenka technique necessarily, some people find it very useful, and they get really good good results from that technique. Yeah. Okay, so then practice that technique. If you get good results, uh, in the end, that is what matters. Uh, yeah, what results do you get? Uh, uh, and, uh, so and, and like that, you can carry on, look at all the various techniques. You can always find fault with all techniques. The only technique you can't find fault with is your own technique. Yeah? That, is <laughs> that one is always the perfect one. Uh, until a few two years down the track, then you look back and think, jeepers, I made all these mistakes. Uh, and then two years down the track, you might disagree with your own technique. But not right now. Not right now. It is good. It's, it's just like the Buddha. I said it was, yeah, my, I, I kind of understood the Buddha's word perfectly. Uh, all these other people, not so sure about them. Uh, that's often how it is. Uh. So, but uh, after a while you start to realize it's not that simple. It doesn't really work quite like that. Uh. Everyone has their bias, everyone has their proclivity. You see things from a certain angle. Uh, and sometimes you just have to accept that there are other viewpoints uh, and they may work for some. There's a, there is some truth to those that maybe you haven't grasped uh, and uh, they may not have grasped all the truth that, uh, you know, that maybe you have seen. Uh. So sometimes we need to be more open-minded and more accepting of various viewpoints. Uh, is Samatha meditation right or is it vipa Vipassana meditation? Well actually I happen to be one of those people who want to do away with that whole divide between Samatha and Vipassana because I think it is a false divide. Uh, I don't think meditation should be divided in this particular way. Uh. But anyway, we can maybe look at that uh, a little bit later on. Uh. But this is always a danger whereby you end up uh, having more joy in arguments coming maybe from uh, some degree of ego. If we want to argue, if you want to investigate the teachings, uh, the purpose should always be to discover the truth rather than just to kind of satisfy our sense of self or something like that. Uh. So ask yourself, are you really there to search for truth or are you there for some other ulterior motive uh, that is not so pure and not so honorable? Uh? Um, and finding fault, yeah, sometimes you want to find fault with people, you ask them a question because you, you think they are really dodgy, so you want to ask them a question to put them on the spot, uh, yeah, rather than actually to really inquire. Yeah. So you're actually asking to find fault, and again, that sometimes it, uh, it doesn't lead anywhere positive when you do that. Yeah. So, this is interesting, he, has, he is obviously quite sharp, this wanderer, he has understood that there is some problems, uh, so now he's asking the Buddha, are you of the same kind or are you different? So what is why do you live this ascetic life for? And then the Buddha replies. Uh, he says, uh, uh, the benefit the realized one lives for, Kundalia, is the fruit of knowledge and freedom. Uh, in other words, the fru fruit, in other words, just for knowledge and freedom. That's why, that's why uh, the Buddha lives this ascetic life. Uh. And um, then Kundalia asks, but what things must be developed and cultivated in order to fulfill this knowledge and freedom? 
And then the Buddha replies, the seven awakening factors. Uh, but what things must be developed and cultivated in order to fulfill the seven awakening factors? Uh, the four kinds of mindfulness meditation, the four satipatthanas. Uh, but what things must be developed and cultivated in order to fulfill the four kinds of mindfulness meditation? The three kinds of good conduct. Uh, what things must be developed and cultivated in order to fulfill the three kinds of good conduct? Uh, sense restraint. Uh. And this is a, a nice little sequence that occurs in uh, at least one other place in the suttas, and, and this is just w one way of uh, kind of this one way of looking at the path. Yeah, that occurs in a few places in the suttas. Uh. And the first one is this idea again that uh, you to gain real f knowledge and freedom, you have to develop samadhi all the way to its highest uh, ability, or the highest uh, development. Uh, and that is why the seven awakening factors, uh, they are the cause for knowledge and vision. Uh. It's interesting, people often ask, well what about vipassana? Yeah, shouldn't we do the vipassana to kind of gain awakening? Isn't, isn't that what it's about? Well, you know, we, we have to kind of see things according to reality. Uh. And this is where I think this whole idea of this dichotomy with vipassana on one side and samatha on the other side gets it wrong, because the whole path is a combination of samatha and vipassana. They always go together. Uh, and when you come to the very towards the very end, as you do here, and samadhi is very profound, uh, you already th th the outcome of that samadhi is that you have very deep calm samatha, and you also have very clear seeing. So the clear seeing, the insight, the vipassana comes automatically with uh, the profound states of meditation. Uh. So these things are not really divided in the way that people talk about it. Uh. What we should do is when we meditate, we should make sure that our minds develops these two qualities. Uh, quality of calm and the quality of clear seeing. Clear seeing is my preferred translation of vipassana, not insight, because insight is a synonym for wisdom, and wisdom is panya in the suttas, uh, and vipassana is the cause for panya. So vi from vipassana comes panya, you develop vipassana more and more, and then wisdom arises out of the clear seeing. Uh. So uh, I think this distinction is, uh, is kind of misplaced. Whatever meditation you do that leads to a decline in your defilements, uh, that leads to both calm and clear seeing, is a good kind of meditation. Uh, you can call it what you like, you can call it vipassana if you want, you call it samatha, it doesn't matter. They have both qualities coming together. Uh. So this is, uh, this is my preferred way of looking at meditation. Take away all this kind of uh, argument and division between samatha and vipassana. Well, not that that's going to work, of course you can't take away those arguments, because people would still argue, that's just the nature of people, but uh, anyway, that's the way I like to look at it. Uh. So we develop those seven awakening factors, uh, and what we have seen just before is that uh, to get to the beginning of those awakening factors, the first one is the satipat is the uh, mindfulness, yeah, the Sati Sambhojanga and the Dhamma Sambhojanga, which are very closely related to Satipatthana meditation, and that's why the four kinds of mindfulness meditation, Satipatthana, is the source or the cause that leads to the seven factors of awakening. And that is anoth another very important thing that you realize straight away. Usually in the uh, Vipassana meditation they will say that Satipatthana is, is called a Vipassana technique, yeah, and, but what you see here is that satipatthana actually leads to samadhi. Satipatthana leads to the seven factors of awakening. Uh, and this is something you see throughout the suttas. Uh. So again, satipatthana cannot really be classified as either samatha or vipassana. Satipatthana is both. Uh, it leads to samadhi. How do you get to samadhi? Through clear seeing and through calming. Two coming together, you get to samadhi. Uh, yeah? And then when you get to samadhi, you have even more calm and clear seeing. So the whole path is this calm and seeing rising together. Samadhi just being one aspect of that calmness as you practice the path. Uh. So, um, yes. Uh, so the, uh, the four kinds of mindfulness meditation are the source for the kind of calm that comes, and, and also vipassana that comes with the seven factors of awakening here. And what is it that causes that? It is the three kinds of good conduct. Uh, and this is, of course, the good conduct by body, speech, and mind. Yeah? And, uh, so, and those th so uh, again, this uh, profound sense of morality feeds directly into the mindfulness med meditation. Satipatthana is based on good conduct. Uh, and uh, again, so if your meditation isn't going so well, uh, you al always ask yourself, 
is there a flaw in my conduct somewhere here? And especially in the mental conduct, that is the hardest part. Uh, if you can find a flaw there, which is quite, most of us have some flaws in our mental conduct. Uh, so then that is where you need to put in some extra effort uh, to sort that out. Uh, so that you maybe you have a little bit less, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sh I know everyone here is already a very good person, otherwise you wouldn't be here, but still, yeah, or probably also everyone here has some little flaws. Uh, so you can uh, look at those flaws and see if you can take it further. Uh. So uh, again, so that is that one. And then we have, the what is the cause for that? And the cause for that uh, uh, is sense restraint. Uh, you must develop sense restraint to be able to have the three kinds of good conduct. Uh. And sense restraint is a very important idea in the Buddhist meditation. And I will talk more about this later on. Uh, but we already have really looked at it already. We talked about how to overcome anger before. Uh, and I made the point that the way to overcome anger is through using wisdom as far as possible. Uh, and then I showed you the sutta uh, with uh, Venerable Sariputta and the five ways of overcoming resentment and anger. Uh, and that really is a type of sense restraint. That is how it is practiced, ideally, by using wisdom. Uh, so the only way you can really purify the mind fully, because uh, that is what the three kinds of good conduct is about, uh, is to have sense restraint. If you haven't got sense restraint, uh, your mind is always going to be at the mercy of the world around you. Uh, yeah, to see something you like, you're going to be drawn out to that. Uh, you see something you dislike, you're going to feel a degree of aversion, maybe ill will arising as a consequence. Uh, so unless your senses are a little bit under control, uh, they're not kind of darting around all the time, seeing this, doing that, uh, uh, you're going to be at the mercy of the defilements of the mind. So sense restraint is a requirement uh, to be able to really have really, really good conduct. But it's important to understand sense restraint in the right way. I'm always concern because the very word sense restraint is actually a, a rather dangerous translation because the idea of restraint in English has the feeling of force about it. Yeah, you restrain somebody, hold them back, you restrain an animal or, or, or whatever it is, or you, you restrain a violent person so they don't kind of do something bad. There's always a degree of force to the idea of restraint. But really, in Buddhism, the uh, res sense restraint is not necessarily, actually usually, it's got nothing to do with force. Uh, it has to do with being wise in how you use your mind. Uh, and this is a, a, a very important difference. Uh, uh, and um, uh, it is really the only way to, to be perfect or to gain mastery of sense restraint is actually through using wisdom rather than using willpower. Because willpower is very weak. Human beings are famous for their weak willpower. Uh, uh, however, we ha we, if we develop ourselves in the right way, we can have a bit of wisdom, uh, and that's what we should develop. Uh. So this, uh, this is one of those um, things that is often uh, you know, talked about in the world. It's quite interesting. Uh, you know, people talk about, um, uh, for example, you know, all the food companies around the world, they want to sell you their food, yeah? and then they fill it up with sugar and all kind of unhealthy things. Uh, and then it says, up to you to look after your own health. Yeah? We just put lots of sugar in there. If you don't want to eat it, eat something else. Uh, and then they advertise it yeah, in big letters so it kind of looks really yummy. So how much willpower do you have in the end of the day? Uh? How much willpower do we actually have as human beings? Uh? It is a very difficult to actually withstand all the temptations and all the conditioning that is around us. In fact, you can't really uh, withstand it. And this is part of the problem. Uh, so very often it is, uh, you know, when the, uh, I think we, we overestimate the willpower and the independence of human beings. And when companies are very good at advertising, uh, they are so good at advertising, they circumvent all your willpower, circumvent all your ability to withstand, uh, and then you just buy it. You think it's your own free will, but actually got nothing to do with your own free will at all. Uh, You've already been brainwashed by these companies. Uh. That, that's why they advertise, yeah, because they can brainwash you, otherwise they wouldn't bother using money on it. Uh, it's only because they know it works that they actually do these things. Uh. So, uh, and, and I think this is a, a weakness in a kind of a modern society. You look at this idea that human beings have free will, that they should take responsibility for themselves. Uh, at the same time, you have all these companies trying to break down your free will. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy. And from a Buddhist point of view, we haven't got that much free will. From a Buddhist point of view, we are entirely conditioned. Uh, and from a Buddhist point of view, it would be good if the governments took a little bit of responsibility and said, we know people haven't got that much free will. We need some kind of regulations to protect people from their own stupidity, from their own lack of free will. Uh, yeah, and then we do the right thing. This is kind of the Buddhist idea. Uh, anyway, so, <laughs> so, uh, 
So this is, uh, so, uh, because uh, you see these arguments all the time going on around the world about uh, to what extent people should take responsibility themselves uh, or to what extent they are conditioned by advertising. Uh, and I, I think it's fairly clear where the Buddhists come down on this. Uh. So sense restraint is exactly the same thing here. We have to be very careful. We know that human willpower is weak. We know that the conditioning is very strong. Uh, so we need some kind of trick and that trick is called wisdom power uh, in Buddhism uh, and wisdom power enables you to then to uh, uh, circum uh, you know to bypass the problem uh, uh, in in a way uh. so uh, um, I'm not going to talk more about that now we can come back to this later on because it is a very important part of the whole practice uh, but it really belongs in the noble eightfold path the six factor right effort uh, and we'll come back to it when we get to that I Hope, we'll see how far we get. Uh, hopefully we'll get that far tomorrow sometime. Uh, and then uh, the Buddha explains this in uh, greater detail. Uh, <coughs> and Kundalia, how is sense restraint developed and cultivated so that it fulfills the three kinds of uh, good conduct? Uh, a mendicant sees an agreeable sight with their eye. They don't desire it or enjoy it. They don't give rise to greed. Their mind and body are steady internally, well settled and well freed. But if they see a disagreeable sight, they're also not dismayed. The mind is not hardened, dejected or full of ill will. The mind and body again are steady internally, well settled and well freed. So uh, this is uh, one particular way that this sense restraint is described uh, and this <coughs> doesn't give you that much idea of how it is done but it gives you more just a, a general outline of what it is about. Uh, so if you see an agreeable sight with the eye, yeah, you see an agreeable sight, uh, then what happens? Well, most people, they give rise to desire. But if you are uh, if you are doing this in the right way, you don't give rise to desire uh, uh, because you know that that desire or greed for it is going to dis destabilize your mind. Uh, at that moment when you have desire, you are going to uh, give rise to agitation and restlessness. Your mind is no longer under control uh, and you lose your mindfulness before you know it. Uh, and before you know it, you're running around uh, and uh, trying to get hold of it or whatever it is, or uh, make enough money to buy it or whatever it is. Uh, and so you become completely immersed by that craving. Uh, <coughs> and uh, so, because you are aware of that, uh, you try to stop it in its tracks. You know it's not worthwhile. Uh, and this is what you do. Well, this, is, this doesn't say much about what you do, but this, uh, this give kind of gives the outcome. We'll have a look more in detail later on how you actually do this to make it work. Uh. So because you don't give rise to that desire, because you know that the desire is painful, uh, you know that you will be running around like the dog from one butcher shop to the next butcher shop, uh, and you don't want to be like a dog, so you avoid that, uh, then uh, your mind is steady, and body are steady internally. Uh, yeah, Instead of having the wavering mind, the restless mind, it is steady. Uh, it is not pulled about by the world. Uh, it is well settled, uh, and it is well freed. This idea of being well freed is very nice. Yeah, you are freed from the grasp of these defilements that uh, suvimuttang is the Pali word. Uh, <coughs> you're freed from the grasp of the defilements. Uh, and uh, so this is considered a freedom. Yeah, And uh, it's kind of strange because uh, the Buddhist idea of freedom is exactly the opposite of the freedom of the world. Uh, the freedom of the world is precisely the freedom to pursue your desires, yeah, to run after them, uh, to make yourself happy by fulfilling all your desires. Uh, good luck. Yeah. Yeah, there's no such thing as <laughs> fulfilling all your desires. It's impossible. It cannot be done. Uh, so there's no such thing. Uh, the only liberation is when you actually give up the desire in the first place uh, and you find true contentment uh, and satisfaction within it. Uh, that is the real freedom. And that is what the Buddhist text is talking about here. Uh. So um, it's, um, that is what we should be, uh, should be moving towards. Uh. And remember the idea that I said before, which is one of the nice little ideas you find in the suttas, uh, is the idea that uh, when you are mindful, when mindfulness is established, uh, you feel like you are a master of yourself. Uh. 
Yeah, you are settled internally. You have the ability to decide. You have the ability to have some control over your mind. Uh, if you want to do one thing, you want to think about one thing, you think about it. You want to think about something else, you do. Uh, the mind is under your control instead of being under the control of the external world, pulling it back and forth. Uh, you feel in charge. It's really nice to be in charge of yourself, isn't it? Uh, rather than having Mara running you around, Mara pulling you by the nose, uh, and you say, yes, sir, and you, whatever Mara says, you will happily do it. Uh, even though, in the end, Mara being in charge does not lead to happiness. So this is this little passage, and this is, uh, just shows you the result. Yeah? So you don't allow <coughs> greed and uh, desire to arise, and this is what happens. You gain the benefit of that. Uh, and because you are mindful, uh, it gives rise to mindfulness, this is how. Actually, first of all, it fulfills the three kinds of good conduct, uh, because you don't allow ill will and and uh, desire to arise, uh, then the three kinds of good conduct become fulfilled uh, because of this. Uh. But before we get to that, uh, let's just have a look very quickly at the other senses. Uh. Furthermore, a mendicant hears an agreeable sound with the ear, smells an agreeable odor with the nose, uh, tastes an agreeable flavor with the tongue, feels an agreeable touch with the body, knows an agreeable thought with their mind. Uh and they don't desire it or enjoy it. They don't give rise to greed. The mind and body are steady internally, well settled and well freed. But if they know a dis disagreeable thought, uh, they're not dismayed. The mind is not hardened, dejected or full of ill will. And the mind and body are steady internally, well settled and well freed. So all five senses plus the mind, which is the sixth sense from a Buddhist point of view, the same kind of idea of uh, stopping yourself from being uh, pulled around by the disagreeable and the agreeable. Uh, and uh, because of that, uh, it means that your mind is relatively pure. Uh, yeah. So because you are relatively pure, it means that the um, mind is also pure. You can assume that your body and speech has already been purified before, because that comes before a sense restraint, yeah? so that is kind of an earlier thing, uh, but with uh, the purification of the mind, then all three kinds of good conduct are purified. Uh. This is how all three kinds of good conduct become purified. Uh. When a mendicant's mind and body are steady internally, uh, uh, they're well settled uh, and well freed, uh, when it comes to both agreeable and disagreeable side smells, Sounds, thoughts, taste, touches, uh, uh, that is how sense restraint is developed and cultivated so as to fulfill the three kinds of good conduct. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, so I hope that makes sense. Uh, if any of this don't, doesn't make any sense or you wonder what's going on, then just write down a question or, or whatever. Uh. Okay, next one. And how are the three kinds of good conduct developed and cultivated so as to fulfill the four kinds of mindfulness meditation. Uh, a mendicant gives up bad conduct by way of body, speech and mind and develops good conduct by, by, by way of body, speech and mind. That is how the three kinds of good conduct are developed and cultivated so as to fulfill the four kinds of mindfulness meditation. Uh, uh, so again, sila is the foundation for satipatthana. Uh, Without sila, it is not going to work. And again, just to remind you why this is the case, it's actually it's very simple, because if the mind is not, if you haven't given up the anger uh, or the ill will or the desires, uh, then the mind is always going to be dragged in the direction of the desire and the ill will. Uh, desire and ill will are very powerful forces, uh, and they're going to drag your mind out to that. Uh, desire being always about the future, thinking about what is possible, Ill will often being about the past, thinking about the people who uh, treated you wrongly or whatever. Uh, yeah. So unless these have died down a long way, so there's only a tiny little bit left of them, uh, you're not going to be able to stay in the present moment. Uh, you're not going to be able to watch the breath uh, because the forces in the mind are going to pull it out. Uh, yeah. You're going to be thinking about this, thinking about that, doing all kinds of things uh, uh, as a consequence. Uh, so this is what you have to do. Uh, of course, when you first come on a meditation retreat, there are also other reasons why you will think. Uh, and one of the reasons why you will think is because you are, have been very busy in the ordinary life doing things. Uh, there is like a residue, there's like a momentum in the mind. So you come down and you can't stop thinking. Yeah? Very common experience for, for most people who have very busy lives. Uh, 
And that's okay. So you first of all, you have to kind of allow things to die down. And then you get to the second stage. That's kind of snoring away a little bit, the second stage. It's also very common, eh, because you have tired yourself out, uh, so then you are really tired for a while. Uh, and then after a day or two on retreat, then you have let go of the restlessness, let go of the tiredness. Uh, then, what comes then? Well, then comes kind of all the future and the past business, yeah? Because then all the deeper defilements start to surface what is actually there. And that is when you find out what you have to deal with in your own life. So there is this gradual thing, you know, you have to know how to deal with the mind, what is the appropriate thing to do at any particular time in your meditation. And it's really, <coughs> you have to figure this out for yourself to a large extent. Uh, you're given a general information and then you have to look into yourself to see what is required. So um, ill will and uh, desire are always going to be the enemies of mindfulness because they're going to draw the mind into the past and the future. Huh? So then, uh, when you're ready for the mindfulness, then, uh, and how are the four kinds of mindfulness meditation developed and cultivated so as to fulfill the seven awakening factors? Uh, a mendicant medic meditates by observing an aspect of the body. Yeah, often translated as a, a body as a body, or something like that, or a body in the body. Uh, but here, I'd also rather translate as, as an aspect of the body, and I think Personally, I, gr I agree with this. I think this is the best way of translating this. Uh, so you observe an aspect of the body, keen, aware, and mindful, uh, rid of uh, desire and aversion for the world. That's exactly my wha the way I like to translate that. That's really nice. Uh, he meditates uh, and observing an aspect of feelings, uh, an aspect of the mind, an aspect of principles, uh, keen, aware, and mindful, uh, rid of desire and aversion for the world. Uh, that's how the four kinds of mindfulness meditation are developed and cultivated so as to fulfill the seven awakening factors. So, um, uh, <coughs> this is the standard uh, explanation for the four Satipatthanas. Uh, I will look at those later on in more detail, uh, but maybe just briefly just to kind of point out some of the important points in here. Uh, and that is uh, uh, when we talk about the kaya uh, kaya nupassi. Uh, this is the uh, the formula for the uh, for formula for the satipatthanas kaya kaya nupassi. It is actually how to translate. This is one of those controversial uh, things in Buddhism, and it's de defined in one way in the uh, commentaries, etc. But kaya kaya nupassi, the natural way of translating it in this context, uh, because each of the different exercises in Buddhism is about focusing on one aspect of that uh, of that thing. Yeah, you try to look at one aspect of the mind, one aspect of feelings, one aspect of the body. So it, it the natural way is uh, contemplating. Uh, a body in the body, in other words, contemplating one phenomenon among many phenomena, contemplating one aspect of the body uh, is what this refers to. So I think this is a very good translation. Not only is it good because I think it is accurate, but it's easy to understand. Everybody can understand, I contemplate an aspect of the body. Uh, yeah, it's just obvious what it means. Uh, but if you say, I contemplate the body as a body, you wonder, what on earth does that mean? Uh, it's, kind of, it's, not, it's not obvious, yeah? it's much more unclear. So uh, instead of having these uh, translations that are very uh, kind of opaque and not transparent, much better to have a transparent translation that everybody can understand. At least if it is transparent, you can agree with it or you can disagree with it, yeah? But if you don't understand it, you can't even disagree with it uh, because you don't know what it means. Uh. <laughs> and that is kind of problematic. We, we can't even have a debate about what it means because you, don't, you, you can't have no idea what it's, what it's talking about. Uh, and that makes it hard. So I, I'm very much the kind of person I prefer I'd rather have a translation that is uh, meaningful but wrong uh, than have a translation that doesn't mean anything at all and you wonder what it, may wonder what it is. Uh, yeah? Because if it's meaningful and wrong, at least you can debate it uh, and you can come to a better one. Uh, but if it is doesn't mean anything, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh. Anyway, just <laughs> this is what happens when you do too much translation. I, I apologize. That's, that's <coughs> so, uh, that is the aspect of the body, and then you are keen, aware, and mindful. Uh, this is, uh, 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 this is um, keen here is atapi, uh, aware is uh, sampajano, mindful is satima. These are these three important terms. Uh, yeah, you have clear comprehension, you are mindful, and you will note that, that you are already mindful when you do 
uh, Satipatthana practice. So it is not about giving rise to mindfulness, it's about using the mindfulness that has already been, is already there. Uh, and then you are rid of desire and aversion for the world. And this is such a beautiful translation. The standard translation there is uh, something like uh, having overcome, uh, having come of uh, covetousness, uh, the co covet covetousness and uh, not aversion, uh, a covet covetousness and uh, what is it? Word, what is the usual word again? Uh, what Domanasa is the Pali. Uh, what what do they translate in English? C having, having overcome covetousness. And grief, grief, that's exactly right, thank you, grief, yeah, that is the one, yeah. Having overcome covetousness and grief for the world, yes? Uh, and so what, what is more meaningful, covetousness and grief, is to me, is, uh, grief is what you feel when someone dies, yeah? You feel grief, oh no, they have died, you feel really sad. It got nothing to do with that, yeah, it's completely misleading. Yeah. Well, covetousness is when you want the belongings of other people. It's kind of an old-fashioned English word. That means that you, I want, you know, if you have a cup of tea, oh, I want to have your cup of tea. Not, maybe you think that about me now, because I'm the one who's got all the tea. Yeah. So, <laughs> but anyway. So, so that's what covetousness and grief means, and this is not what is going on here. What is going on here is about the senses being pulled out into the world, and you either like or dislike the sensory objects. It fits in directly with the sense restraint before. So this is a wonderful translation, rid of desire and aversion. Desi you either you like the sensory object or you dislike them, which is aversion. Yeah. So you can say rid of liking and disliking. That's another way of putting it, maybe even more direct. Uh, but uh, that is much better. And, and um, for the world, and that is still a little bit obscure what that means, uh, but uh, the word world is very broad in... Uh, Buddhism, uh, the word is loka in Pali, uh, and in this case it must mean the world of the five senses, uh, yeah, the sensory world. Uh, and that is actually has that specific meaning in, in a number of cases in the suttas. We know that is one meaning, and that is the meaning that makes sense here in this context. Uh, so you have no desire or aversion uh, in the world of the five senses. Uh, now it's coming together, yeah? Now you know what it means, uh, hopefully. Uh, at least you know a little bit more. Uh, at least you have a starting point. Uh, so that is that uh, formula, and that is how it works and for each of the four of these uh, um, satipatthanas. Uh, so that how the four kinds of mindfulness meditation are developed and cultivated so as to fulfill the seven awakening factors. Uh, and how are the seven awakening factors developed and cultivated so as to fulfill the knowledge and freedom? Uh, a mendicant uh, develops, or a monk or nun develops, or a lay person even, develops the awakening factor of mindfulness, uh, of investigation, of uh, teachings, or principles, or m mental states, or whatever it is, uh, of energy, the awakening factor of rapture or joy, uh, the awakening factor of tranquility, uh, the awakening factor of stillness, immersion, samadhi, uh, the awakening factor of equanimity, or evenness of mind, uh, which relies on seclusion, fading away, cessation, and ripens in letting go, or giving up. That is how the seven awakening factors are developed and cultivated so as to fulfill knowledge and freedom. Why is that? Why, how does this connection work between mindfulness and uh, the awakening factors? It's simply, you can think about the whole thing simply as the mindfulness of breathing. And if you think uh, back to the mindfulness of breathing sutta that we did before, uh, it actually gives rise to all of these factors as you watch the breath. Uh, all you have to do, sit back, uh, allow the breath to be, uh, and as you allow the breath to be, all of these magical things happening inside of you. Uh, this is the real magic in Buddhism. Yeah, All you have to do is sit back, uh, wait and be mindful, uh, and the whole world just transforms inside of you as you watch the breath. Uh, the breath is like the most natural, the most obvious thing uh, in the universe almost. Uh, and still it has this incredibly magic potential to transform your whole inner world into a joyous, peaceful, tranquil sphere. Uh, it's very, uh, it's, it's amazing how, how the most you know, the simple things in life can be so powerful. Uh. So, uh, that is uh, how it happens. Uh, uh, it all happens pretty much automatically here. Uh, and how they fulfill knowledge and freedom. And of course, knowledge and freedom is vidya and vimuti. And that is the seeing of the Four Noble Truths. It is uh, seeing 
the uh, past lives, if you want to see that, whatever you want to see, at this point you can pretty much see it. Uh, so if you want to see rebirths and all these things, uh, it is available to you. Uh, and the psychic powers perhaps. Uh, uh, at this point I think you get pretty, you're pretty kind of uh, uninterested in psychic powers, uh, but if you still have a little bit of interest, uh, this is what happens when you get to this particular point. Uh. Freedom. What is freedom in Buddhism? And again, it's freedom from suffering, uh, freedom from defilements. Uh, and uh, that's kind of the main kinds of freedom. Uh, and of course, the, uh, that, that freedom is of course a, an extraordinarily happy state of mind. Uh. When he said this, the wonder Kundalia said to the Buddha, Excellent, Master Gautama, excellent! Uh, as if he were writing the overturned, or revealing the hidden, uh, or pointing out the path to the lost, uh, or lighting a lamp in the dark, uh, so people with good eyes can see what's there. Master Gautama has made the teaching clear in many ways. Uh, I go for refuge to the Master Gautama, to the teaching, and to the mendicant Sangha. Uh, from this day forth, may Master Gautama remember me as a lay follower who has gone for refuge for life. Uh, and this is what they say at the end. It's a beautiful little, uh, little saying at the very end there. This idea that uh, it is as if you have righted what is overturned. Yeah? Suddenly you see the world in an entirely new way. When you get the full insight into these teachings, uh, it is as if the world goes upside down. Uh, you have re revealed what is hidden. Uh, the Dhamma is kind of behind curtains, uh, it is behind a veil, you can't see it properly. You have some idea that maybe there's something there, but you've never really seen it. Uh, and the Buddha comes and it draws away the veil from the world. Uh, this is one of the epithets that you see, in, or one of the uh, descriptions you see in the Sutta, that the Buddha's purpose is to draw away the veil from the world, uh, so you can see the Dhamma, see what is there properly for the first time, gain clarity. Uh, yeah, you reveal what is hidden. Uh, you're pointing out the path to those who are lost. Uh, most people, we're walking down the kumaga or the umaga. Kumaga, umaga is like the wrong path. Uh, and then suddenly the Buddha comes along and says, well, why are you walking that path? Uh, that just only leads to dukkha. Are you sure you want to go the path that leads to dukkha? Hmm, maybe her point. Is there an alternative path? Yes, there is the Eightfold Path that goes this way. Okay, let's check it out. Uh, yeah, you reveal the path to those who are lost. Uh, cannot, you're fumbling in the darkness. And this is the last one, uh, you're lighting a lamp in the dark uh, so that those with good eyes can see what's there. Yeah, the idea of light being a metaphor or a simile for uh, wisdom in Buddhism. Uh, you, you turn on the light and if you have good eyes, uh, if your faculties are ripe, if you're ready to become a Buddhist, if you have not been kind of too conditioned by some other uh, something else, uh, then you have the ability to see what's there and then you're ready and you can follow the path along. Uh, so all of those beautiful little similes for what uh, uh, happens when you come into the Buddhist teachings uh, and you see what is, what is going on. Uh, most of the time things are hidden for us, the truth is hidden behind a veil. It is all dark, we don't know what's going on. We think the light is on because these lights are on, but this is the wrong kind of light. We need the light in the mind that sees things clearly. That is the only mind, light that really works. So, and then uh, when you get that, uh, then you go for refuge, uh, yeah? And this is kind of the thing, instead of going for refuge to the worldly things uh, and expecting happiness there, now you expect happiness uh, in the teachings of the Buddha instead. Uh, and that is when you become a lay follower, you go for refuge for life. Uh, so uh, this is what these uh, people often would do. Uh. So, uh, there you are. That is the seven factors of uh, awakening uh, and uh, that is a uh, 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 good time to stop actually uh, so it's quite quite nice so let's have another break uh, till to about quarter to three and then we can continue with the idipadas after that we'll have a quick look at the idipadas uh, uh, the, um, uh, the powers powers of the minds so we'll have a look at that afterwards uh. okay let's have a short break <laughs>